Kestrel Country Podcast, where we discuss the people, places, and events all around Kestrel Country. Aaron Youngren, thanks for coming in. You are welcome. Great to be here. Yeah. Um, I always like to start off, you know, so our podcast is about the people, places, and events around the area. And so I just like to start out by finding out more about who I'm talking to. So can you give us just a brief up, you know, background of where'd you grow up? Where are you from? Um, and yeah. Yeah. Start there. So grew up uh, just north of Seattle. Uh, okay. Between Everett and Snohomish. Lived in a small, ideal American house, um, walked to school every day, came home to chocolate chip cookies, ran out to play in the forest in the back, um, grew up there until I was eight in the Pacific Northwest. And then we moved down to, I don't want to call it the armpit of America, but <laughs> the Coachella Valley, Palm Springs area. Okay. Okay. Um, I was going to think, I was thinking Ohio when I heard that, but that's because I'm from Michigan. So, well, when I heard there was a, a festival actually like an indie rock festival down in the Coachella Valley, I just could not believe it because I spent my teenage years there blistering hot, just, a um, housing developments as far as the eye can see, um, kind of a weird place. But then I moved back to, moved back to Seattle, uh, met my wife in Seattle, um, started my career there. I worked for amazon.com for about seven years. Okay. Um, wild adventure, early years, led a global innovation team there. Then we moved out to Chicago. Um, and I actually started a, a church there. Um, and we did that for about 12 years okay. out in Chicago. We're out in Chicago for about 12 years. Um, you know, you know, about nine years in, it was time for that to be done. Went back to the corporate world and worked for uh, GE Healthcare. And then, you know, at some point, we're living in Chicago. We had a, a two flat, nice two flat, and um, we, we were living in that. So you were and, living in this, like in Chicago. Oh, yeah, Chicago, Chicago prop. Yeah, people say Chicago. Yeah, I know. I was, I was picturing, <laughs> yeah, like Wheaton or, yeah. I think it's all the way up to Milwaukee. You can say you live in Chicago. Yeah, but, but um, you were like, for that whole 12 years, you were in Chicago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robert? Chicago wow. proper. Yep. And, um, but a couple things. One, my kids were getting older, um, and I was just, you know, kind of doing the math on our two flat. Property taxes are going up all the time. Um, it started to look like, hey, in three or four years, this is just not going to pencil anymore. Um, and also, you know, Chicago at that point was becoming the kind of city where you couldn't really imagine people wanting. It's it's fun to come in and go to museums and all of the the big city perks, but when you get into grandkid, you know, the grandkid era, it was difficult to see, you know, our kids' families coming in to stay in Chicago. Hmm. So we started looking around for, you know, it would be the ideal place if we could just pick where we wanted to live. Um and we knew about New St. Andrews College, came out here to visit, and um, I, you know, my, my daughter Madeline did kind of like the visitor's day here in, in Moscow, New, New St. Andrews. I took my other daughter, Alaska, and we drove up Highway 6, hit St. Mary's, drove around Coeur d'Alene, um, and, and came back, and I, I just, I was just what is this place? Like, what, why have I never heard of this place? So you, you'd never been here. Never. Even yeah. growing up in the Northwest. No. Never no, been over this. No. Had you ever been to like Pullman or, or just no. stayed on the I-5 mm -hmm. kind of corridor? Yeah, stayed over there. And um, so just totally unaware of this, you know, truly hidden gem. Um, and then, you know, we came back and hung around in town. And the town is great. So town is great. Beauty's great. Um, is very quiet when you get just outside of the city, which you can be outside of the city in seven minutes. Yeah. You, know? <laughs> you can walk to the outside of the city. Um, 
where you you know if you walked it'd probably take a week or so to get outside of the chicago suburbs yeah really. um, <laughs> yeah you know that's funny yeah you mentioned that because that's one of the things that i've i that struck me about really the whole northwest though honestly yeah even seattle as big a city as it is growing up in in detroit area in yeah. the midwest similar to chicago where it's like you can just drive and drive and you're still in suburbs. Like right. you're just nothing's <laughs> right. changed. It's still flat. It's still houses. Exactly. And you come out here and even like so my sister and brother in law live actually in Snohomish. Okay. Over there. Nice. And um, you know, even in the city though, they used to live in Bothell. It's like you get up on top of a hill and you can see wilderness. Right. It's like <laughs> you can at least be like, okay, if I just get a little ways out, like it's it's contained. And I feel like Moscow is a great example of that. Even yeah. Spokane. It's like it's a cool thing about the area is that you go a little ways out and you can be in the mountains or in that beauty. Yeah. Which is yeah. cool. Yeah. So we took that drive, literally um, came back to our Airbnb, and then I scooped both girls up in the car and we did the same exact thing the next day, only we hit Montana that time. And and to this day, we still, you know, make, make those loops um, and uh, just – you know, loved it. Absolutely loved it. So I, I called my wife and said, I think, I think we're going to move here. Wow. Yeah. So what was your, you said you knew about New St. Andrews. That was your main connection yep. to Moscow. And how did you find out about NSA? Well, it was one main connection. Actually, my, um, my father-in-law um, has family here going pretty far back. Oh, wow. And so that's been pretty fun is, is we, you know, we'll we'll go to the VFW and see. Oh, there there's a picture, you know, of wow. Uncle so great Uncle so and so. Um, so that 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 is pretty fun as well. So my wife actually, you you know, had been out kind of around this area. They have family over in Montana, um, but it was just kind of a hidden connection. We didn't really even think much about. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So what, it, your father in law from Moscow. No, he, he he's not from here, but okay. his his parents, yeah, are from Moscow. We're, we're okay. from around here, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, on our on not my side, my family is all Michigan from you know way way back, but Catherine's side had were um, she is I believe fifth generation Moscow. Oh, wow. So yeah, like long term. Wow. I mean, I'm sure some of your wife's ancestors and right. my wife's probably right. knew each other, given how small it was at the time. Yeah, but yeah, that's kind of a cool cool connection. Yeah. Yeah. So how has, how has that transition been from living in a flat in downtown Chicago to small town, Moscow, Idaho? Was it, was it a fairly major adjustment at first? I mean, if something being wonderful is an adjustment, (laughs) then yes. I mean, now what, like for your kids, (laughs) so they were, how old were they when, when you moved here? Yeah. uh, My oldest, was 18, I believe. Okay. So and, they uh, pretty 17, much 17. grew yeah. up pretty much of their oh, yeah. known they life in was in, in the city of Chicago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I imagine for them it was a pretty big, it was a big change. Um, you, you know, there, there are little things that we miss about the city and being in a big city. And there's, there's part of that. That's really fun. At the end of the day, it's, you know, the place that you live matters and the place that you're doing the daily grind matters. And some of the um, luster of living in a big city, well, you also have to deal with it every day. So my kids, you know, grew up jumping over puke puddles after the Cubs games and, you know, that that kind of thing. There's a reality to city life that mm. is not always, you know, pleasant. Um, and so we we just have never looked back, like not once. It's just been wonderful from day one. Um, and, and honestly, some of the things that, that people talk a lot about, um, with living in a city, yeah, you have museums and things like that, but you can take a vacation and go to museums. Um, but the food and, um, you know, restaurants and things like that. I I think that's one of the unique things about Moscow Hundred percent is it's rare to have a, small town that is also offering excellent small business, you know, things, restaurants and things like that. Um, I think that's, that's pretty rare. A lot of times you have small towns that are trying. Um, but so it's, it's very, 
it's been great for us. Yeah. Well, the university obviously helps with that, yeah. being able to support those restaurants and things, but also just that kind of activity and culture, you know, to have a small right. town and you still have, you know, jazz festival every year. You have all these things that come in because of, you know, the universities, which is, it, yeah, it makes it a pretty unique place. Yeah. So. Absolutely. So you worked at Amazon and then GE Health. Mm -hmm. What were you doing in both of those you know, role, was a similar thing in both of those places. Yeah. So, um, I had a, a really great experience being at amazon.com when I was, um, it was about five years into the company is when wow. I started. Um, it was growing at an incredibly rapid pace. I was in this back office finance ops team hmm. and, um, you know, we were selling books and, you know, it was chaotic and disorganized enough that we weren't paying our bills on time. Um, and it, you know, kind of bothered me um, coming into this new job and we're not doing our job well. And so I, I took that home and um, cobbled together some tools for our team that turned into um, a, a long series of roles in which my job was to form teams to make money for the company by building things. And that's how I got hmm. into product, which is what I do right now. Okay. Um, and so most of my roles have been building products, building teams, um, building services that are high yield, let's say. Um, so, so finding what the opportunities are within a particular organization, capitalizing on the top opportunities, and then helping everyone get their heads around um, what those opportunities are and why we should jump on them. And, and that's the role I'm in today with red balloon. Um, I'm head of product over there and I spend all day, every day thinking about that. Hmm. Yeah. So you said you, when you started Amazon, it was, you know, you're selling books and it's chaotic, it's early. Um, so when you say finding like creating products that then, you know, are profitable for the company. Yeah. Um, are there like, what are some examples of those? Sure. Was it branching out from books or was sure. it, you know, creating the, the, the right type of platform to make it better or what? Yeah. You know, what so, so, um, I, I was focused on internal products to help make our teams more intelligent okay. and take action quicker. You know, when I first arrived, we were, you know, it was early on, but we were doing a lot of business starting to get into um, businesses with big players um, like electronics, right? We went into electronics and um, we had Sony and all these players coming on um, looking at us like we were the redheaded stepchild because we kind of were looking at us be like we didn't really know what we were doing because we kind of didn't <laughs> um, <laughs> and treating us accordingly. Um, and, and so in the midst of that, somehow when you're growing 35, 40% a year, um, you have to figure out how to keep pace operationally. Right. And so the, the products that I, um, and my team ended up, up building were mostly around, um, business intelligence. How do we ensure that the right people are seeing the right information at the right time, making the right decisions um, so just to give you an example, one one of the the little products that I and my team created um, that started as, you know, a Saturday take it home. I probably wasn't even supposed to. I'm going to build this little thing in Excel and use these macros and things like that. That ended up yielding um, six million dollars for the company over a period of a, a couple of years wow. um, just because we were able to do things a little bit more efficiently. And so one, at some point, you know, my, my leadership team, um, just kind of said, Hey, why don't you do that full time? Hey, why don't you go recruit a SWAT team? Um, it did very well. We got a, I got to receive a, an award from Jeff Bezos himself, mm. um, in front of like 6,000 people. It was really fun. Wow. Um, but it, you know, it was mostly internal there. When I was at GE Healthcare, um, I was in charge of the digital analytics for about 1,400 marketing sites, including the main flagship site, um, kind of monitoring who, who was doing what, when they were coming in, working with marketing teams to try to optimize their efforts. 
So is your, would you say, I'm maybe I'm butchering it, but um, your, your role would be kind of looking for inefficiencies in the operations of the business and figuring out how can we, yeah, how can we fix those problems? That's been part of it. Um, that's been part of it. I, I, I definitely have, have done a lot of outward facing work too. The, the work that I'm doing right now at Red Balloon is mostly outward facing. Um, so in the last year we spun up a professional services team that, um, you know, basically is trying to bridge the gap between, um, job postings, which is what Red Balloon does. We you know, allow employers to j- post jobs, but bridge the gap between job postings and recruiters, which now given a tight labor market are, are charging somewhere between 15 and 40% of first year salary, hefty wow. chunk for a small business. Yeah. Um, so we've created a professional service product that costs about, you know, a fifth of that. And um, we go out and do all kinds of recruiting work, give them business intelligence. Um, and that's been wildly successful. Um, so that that's a very externally facing product. Now it's a human product. Yeah. Um, it's a service. Um, but that's, you know, we're very active on that. We'll be releasing an applicant tracking system um, later on this year and working on that every day. That's awesome. So how did you, what was the transition from GE Health to Red Balloon, and I guess behind that question too, would you when you first moved here, was it a remote work type situation? Mm-hmm. And a lot yes. of people have we've seen a lot of growth here because of that. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So my my first days in Moscow, um, you know, I was you know, getting up at four o'clock, um, which I'm a morning person anyway. I love the mornings, but up at four o'clock, but then in front of teams at five AM because you know, we're in an international business. I'm remote. Um, I'm working with people over in India. Um, so bright and shiny by then. Um, and just kind of having a conversation with a laptop all day long. Um, and, uh, so working at GE after some time, um, some of their policies as we got further and further into COVID here, I am locked in my office. Um, not seeing anyone but my family during the week um, because they are related to the government. They, was that while you're in Chicago? No, no, no. While, no, I was while here. you're here. Yeah, while okay. I was here. Okay. So fully remote. Now, I mean, I hadn't seen a person from GE in a year and a half. Wow. Um, and then they, they rolled out a, a vaccine mandate, which I had already decided I was not going to, I was not going to do. Um, and there were some other things, you, you know, I, um, in the early years, just learning business, uh, I was a great admirer of some of the things that Jack Welsh put into place at GE, um, read a couple of his books. When I got to modern GE, um, the reality of what that, and I, and I think that's true of a lot of big organizations now, what they've kind of turned into um, kind of a the caricature of a slow moving bloated organization a lot of great people, you know, that I worked with, but just very difficult to, for a company like that to think clearly. Mm. So I started having a conversation um, with Andrew um, Crappy Shets, our CEO in town, about his this new business, Red Balloon, that he was starting. Um, GE accepted my um, religious exemption request. So okay. I did continue to work there and did some consulting work for Red Balloon for a while. But then after a while, I just, we, came together and said, Hey, let's, let's build this thing. So, so you, I, I back up a little bit. Okay. They were, they were going to require the vaccine, even though you were a hundred percent remote. And, oh yeah. And like in oh, your, yeah. in your house in Idaho. People, people don't understand this. <laughs> That's the case for, you know, untold number of Americans, right. Mm. Who are working in large multinational corporations. It was a really weird time. And I I talked to people, you know, who had no, you know, real political affiliation, hadn't thought about that twice. But when it came down to it, um, you know, there was a moment where the leaders were going to gather together again for for GE. And, uh, you know, one one of my colleagues was saying just the enormous pressure that was put on her. Well, you haven't gotten the vaccine yet. You need to go get it. 
And she's saying, this just doesn't feel right. I don't know why, hmm. but why are you telling me to do this when I'm locked in my house? Yeah. Right. Um, anyway, so bit of a mess. Yeah. But that's not unrelated then to Red Balloon. Right. I mean, a lot of what it is not a lot of what Red Balloon <laughs> is doing is the whole, the freedom economy. The um, yeah, I guess. Tell us. Tell us a little about we had Andrew on a while back. Um, yeah. But I guess especially now, um, what was that? What was that like getting into Red Balloon, a startup? Um, and uh, yeah, how, how's how's that been going? Yeah. So the core premise of of Red Balloon is that there are still businesses that want to value hard work, right? That, that, that want employees that are going to think critically and work hard. Um, if you're an employee that is working hard, wants to be rewarded for your work, wants to think critically, and your leaders are not doing that, like every day they're showing you that they're not really thinking critically about things that are happening. That happened a lot in COVID. Um, and, and making a decision not to respect the medical privacy of their employees, um, increasingly clamping down on particular ideologies, not giving any breathing space at all for people to have other ideas. I mean, I would routinely get, um, emails, company wide emails, um, when, when certain events would go on in the United States, police shootings, things like that, telling us exactly how to think about those. Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the senior leaders of those corporations, and I said this in my, I wrote an open letter to the CEO and about 200 of my colleagues when I left, um, they have to understand that you're losing credibility by the day. Your business is becoming weaker because that's not happening in a black box. You're doing it in public and everyone who is supposed to be looking up to you um, as a reasonable data-driven leader um, is, is seeing behavior that they do not want to follow. Um, and so Red Balloon, <clears throat> we're trying to make a space that um, where people can find businesses like that. People can find businesses that reward hard work um, and that are not going to punish their employees for their political beliefs. Um, and that has really hit, hit a chord with um, job seekers and employers all over America who, who want that. And um, our, our view is in the long run, those are the only businesses that are going to survive, hmm. right? You yeah. can't just go forever. Um, and we've had recent examples of businesses making blunders where you have to assume that the, the people at the top are just zombies, not to see, not to see it coming, uh, ma making blunders. Um, you can't be thoughtless forever. You can't just adopt certain talking points forever without having a real philosophy behind them. Um, and so we want to build the kind of America where hard work is rewarded and people have the right to have their thoughts and beliefs in the workplace. Yeah. Now, if, going back to the GE company, why emails? I mean, was there an attempt to relate those types of things to the business or was it just kind of like, Hey, Absolutely this is happening not. here. So it wasn't even as, yeah, it was not business minded. It was no, purely political. It had nothing to do with what we were, what we were doing. Um, and it, and it was that, you know, the very definition of, of virtue signaling and oftentimes virtue signaling on issues that were not at all clear, right? Like some, some of these, police shootings that would happen. What you want people to do is to take a deep breath, step back, wait for the facts. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm talking about, um, you know, one email was sent by the president of the operation, president of operations, of the United States, like one of the top 10 leaders at GE describing in detail um, how this was another example of systemic racism um, we all need to be aware that this is happening. All of this, it was 48 hours after the event. Wow. No one knew what had happened. And then, of course, the facts come out and, oh, guess what? It's not actually as simple as you think it was, you know. And um, the, the particular event I'm thinking of, 
you know, police were acquitted. You know, the facts were actually really clear when they all came out. It wasn't as it, it was not a a case of of racism at all. Mm. And the point of that is just it's not to say that you know there can't be racial incidents. Of course there can. Yeah, it's not not that it's not that the take was necessarily right or wrong. Right. But the fact that it's one right. jumping the gun, two, how is this relating to right our work and, at GE? Exactly right. And so when you're relying on a leader to be the most clear-headed person in the organization, and they are demonstrating to you regularly that they are not, and then not only that, but everyone under them and under them is demonstrating to you regularly that they are not because they're just smiling and nodding. And yes, I've been thinking a lot about the way that I think about these issues as well, you know, <laughs> giving that speech all over the place. Um, so, it, you know, I mentioned that I, I wrote an open letter to the CEO and, and um, a couple hundred of my colleagues. The response, I gave my back channel email, you know, my personal email and that, and, and the response through private channels from people that I would have never guessed in my life um, were losing faith in those leaders was really overwhelming. Hmm. Yeah. And that was, af- was that w- after you had already made the decision to go to Red Balloon? Yeah. So you're already thinking yeah, along I'm out those of lines. Here. Yeah. My thought yeah. was, um, I, I'm out of here anyway. I had talked to enough people who said, I don't like what's going on, but I don't know what to do that. I wanted to be loud a little bit while I yeah. could and throw a stick of dynamite. Well, right and that's one of the things that, you know, has come through at least watching on social media, what red balloons doing that kind yeah. of thing, um, is that kind of helping give a voice or maybe not even give a voice, but give some confidence to, yeah. to people who maybe feel like, I, am I the only one in this big organization that thinks this way? Exactly. Like right. is everybody, you know, and, and the fact that, our media and everything else kind of makes is calculated in a way to make those of us who are conservative feel alone, right? right? Feel like, Oh man, I guess maybe nobody actually thinks this way. Um, yeah. So that's a big part of what Red Balloon's doing. Yeah. And I think that got way worse in the middle of, of COVID where now everything that I'm saying and doing is on a, company sponsored channel. That's my only communication with other people in this company. We don't go out for beers after work Hmm. anymore. (laughs) And um, yeah, I think there are a lot of people that felt really isolated during that time. So you jumped into Red Balloon. How long have you been there now? Two years. Two years. Yeah. And um, how similar... I mean, I know you weren't like in the garage with Jeff Bezos early days, right? <laughs> no, but like, not. Would, would you have characterized your was Amazon? Did it have kind of that startup feel when you were there? Absolutely, yeah. And it, and you're getting some of the same yeah. feeling here. Absolutely, and and um, one of the amazing things about Amazon.com, early years or not, I, you know, I'm told because I don't work there anymore, but I'm told this really has only faded in the last decade. Hmm. But the feeling of a highly empowered, merit-based culture in which um, the best ideas are going to win, um, the hard work is going to win, you will get rewarded for it, it's highly encouraged, um, that that was a real pleasure. That was a real pleasure. Hmm. And I've been a part of a lot of different initiatives and small organizational startups and things like that. Um, in the intervening time. Um, But it really has been special to come back to a a do or die, you know, we're, we're in this um, together and we're going to make it go uh, kind of organization and just a wonderful team, you know, just incredible people that I'm working with. Um, It's a delight to go to work every day. I don't think I've ever really heard startup, the startup culture or startup um, defined quite that way. Mm. That's really interesting. Is that that's your kind of your take on it is that, hey, it's merit based hard work. It's because it, I, I always you kind of feel like this is there's that energy to it. There's yes. that like, hey, we're all in this together. We're pulling We're you know, what we do matters because it's not this huge organization. Right. But that kind of merit based, the best ideas are going to win, do or die. That's interesting. Absolutely. I, I like to um, think of it as a, a MacGyver situation, right? You know the clock is ticking. You've got 
your chocolate bar and your paper clip. <laughs> what are we going to do? Yeah. Um, and obviously the, you know, the, the delightful thing is we're trying to find value for our neighbors that we can bring to them. We're trying to uh, striking gold for us is finding something that's useful to people. Mm. And so every day you're, you're focused, you, know, you should be focused outwardly. Now, if you're in a startup that is way overfunded, um, that can afford to, Hey, let's get a, a you know, penthouse suite for everyone. Let's get the ping pong tables and the arcade machines and nap rooms and all that crap. Um, that's different. You know, that's different because money is not real in that, um, yeah. in that kind of an environment. Um, but when money is real, as it was at, at Amazon, as it is at red balloon, and you are truly trying to solve the problem of, um, someone else's business process of someone else's obstacle. You're trying to solve it for them in a way that they will pay you money for. It's just a wonderful work environment. That's awesome. So Red Balloon's obviously grown a ton in those two years. Were yeah. you one of the first employees? Yeah, we had, when I came in, uh, it was Andrew and his brother and um, some other folks on contract. And um, so there were th like three of us full time. And then now we have about 35 employees. Wow. Yeah. That's exciting. Is that you mentioned at uh, certainly at Amazon um, having a big part of what you're doing was building product, but also building teams. Mm -hmm. So is that a lot of what you're doing now too, is helping yeah. build that team? And um, yeah, if it is hiring, hiring is obviously a huge part of what Red Balloon uh -huh. does, right? <laughs> um, is that something that you enjoy and that you've kind of found as something that you're good at? Yeah, absolutely. So in the high growth years at Amazon.com, um, you know, I did hundreds, hundreds of interviews um, I, I definitely had the moments where I couldn't wait for any of our recruiting teams. And so I had the four inch stack of resumes that I, you know, I'm trying to go through. Um, and Amazon had a great hiring culture and I've carried that throughout, um, throughout my career. Um, it, it is a, I, I believe in, and this is kind of our philosophy at Red Balloon. There's a part of hiring that's irreducibly human. Um, the industry really wants to go in the direction of algorithms and AI. And mm. some, some of those things can augment the tools that we use. Um, but if you are consistently saying no to someone um, based on what is probably a pretty imprecise algorithm, um, everyone gets frustrated by this, by this system. And um, so when you recognize the parts of it that are irreducibly human you honor those parts because it's if I was to come to you and say, here's why I think you should spend 50, 60, 100, $125,000 per year of the, the money that you have um, worked so hard to create in this business. Here's why I think you should do that. And it's going to be a good investment. I mean, that's an intense. Here's why I think yeah. you should take that money and put it into me. <laughs> you know, that that's a pretty intensely human activity. Yeah. It's pretty vulnerable. Um, and um, well, and like you were saying earlier for a small business, right? That's a huge, right? I mean, that's, that's a huge decision. Exactly. Um, and one that I know personally, it's, yeah, one of the, honestly, probably one of the least favorite parts of my job is hiring yeah. the hiring yeah. process. And it's one of the biggest, you know, stressors in terms of like, am I making the right decision? Because yep. when you don't, it's not only very expensive, it can be, you know, difficult and stressful and, you know, that kind of thing as well. Yeah, that's um, absolutely right. And, and we, um, you know, hiring has gotten actually a lot worse in recent years because the number of employment lawsuits hmm. um, that ha has, has risen dramatically um, the number of discrimination lawsuits in hiring has risen dramatically. And now um, it's gotten to the point where when someone's bringing a discrimination lawsuit, they not only will go after the person hiring, but any adjacent 
um, tools or, or, or um, organizations that they used. So if you're a staffing company and you're looking to hire and someone brings a discrimination suit, the staffing company can be get pulled that in, it, pu- mm. pulled into that as well. And so that's <clears throat> part of why we created this professional services team is um, we asked what if, what would it look like for us to just take this over for some of these small businesses, take the, all of the first steps over, do it in a human way, do it in a legally vetted way, because we can be experts where they probably can't. Right. Um, and just help them, just help them get, get that great candidate. They're going to do the final step, you know, but yeah. And that's relatively new. Yeah. For Red Balloon. Yeah. Past going year. Well. It's going really well. That's it's awesome. Really well. Yeah. So what do you see? What's next? Um, are you, you're running, I, what's your title? What are you exactly I, uh, doing? Head of product and delivery, which okay. means so you're doing a I'm lot. running ahead <laughs> of our, our software efforts and then running ahead of our uh, managing the professional services team. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm in some of the day to day, but then also I have managers working for me. So, okay. So continuing to kind of look for what are the things that we can be doing to get ahead of the problems and correct. I heard it was interesting. I heard a quote from a guy I was talking to yesterday. He said, I, th- I think it was his accountant who don't know how precise it was, but essentially, if you want to protect your money, find a problem. Or I, in his case, it was about investing. He was like, buy a problem and fix it. Nice. And I think it was kind of related to real estate and that kind of thing, too. But um, yeah, I, that really hit home with me and what you were just saying about like, hey, if we can, if, if we, I can spend my time figuring out, what are the problems for these end users? What are the problems for them? We can fix them. Right. Then they'll pay us for it and we can have a viable business. And you Absolutely. have to connect what you're doing directly to that, especially Absolutely. when you're in a, in that growth phase phase. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Good, good. So in this next year, we'll um on the software side, we're gonna release what's called the applicant tracking system. And we are going to take the step of making it culture first. So essentially when you, um, when you're running a hiring process, if your organization is a little bit larger and you want to do that in a controlled way, um, you you want applicants to come in and kind of be routed through that process. You want the people in that process to understand what they need to talk about in their interview, what they need to check off their list. Um, so an applicant tracking system uh, kind of does all of that automatically and we put together a pretty, I'm, I'm really excited um, mm. with the way that we have, have sketched this out. We're building it right now. Um, but it's going to be culture first. Um, businesses are, are kind of afraid to talk about their culture anymore. They don't know what words they can use and not use yeah. in an age when, you know, math is racist and all of these things. Um, and they want to focus on, on merit. Um, what can I actually say? Well, we, we know because we work with um, employment lawyers, what they can say and not say, and we're going to help them to be able to, you know, funnel their candidates through the lens of their culture, the culture that they, you know, probably spent 10 or 20 years carefully building. Hmm. Now we're in this new era. Um, how, how do I ensure that the people are, that are coming in share my values um, and so we're building software around that and I'm really excited about it. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. And red balloon dot work for people. Red balloon find dot it, work. Find it, yes. Find out about it. Yes. Awesome. Good. Well, thanks Aaron. Yeah. You I bet. Appreciate the time. Great. And yeah, really fun. Exciting to see what happens next with red balloon. I'm excited too. All right. Thanks for joining us. Like, share, subscribe. We'll see you next week.